So, uh, about 30 years ago, I took my oldest son to uh, Hartford to introduce him to, to, uh, to his wife. And uh, introduced him to a guy that I knew by the name of Gunther Bowles. Gunther Bowles was a storage pilot in World War II. English was a second language for Gunther. And the problem with that is my son at the time, and was, I don't know, 12 or 13, was a single language guy. And uh, he didn't do German real well, and Gunther didn't do English real well. So uh, they didn't, it wasn't a match made in heaven anyway. But uh, friends at uh, Sylvania Soaring Adventures in, in Beloit, and uh, they've been there for, gosh, a few years now. And uh, we're glad to have Kurt Lewis, uh, who was originally from Rockford, and I guess maybe still living and working there, certainly is going to talk to us today, uh, he's flying out of uh, Beloit. He originally picked up his uh, airplane rating in 1977, he got a glider rating in 1986, and then in 2001 he became a glider flight instructor. And is today a uh, cross-country glider racing pilot. He has 16 soaring speed and distance records, 18 national and regional soaring meets he's competed in, and has had two regional wins and one national soaring championship win. Are you going to talk about those things? I can. That, that, I'm, I'm always excited to hear about new stuff. And racing glider sounds like a lot of uh, interesting <laughs> stuff back there. He's made numerous presentations on soaring performance and safety. And uh, of course, that's what brings us all together today. And to pay for that uh, hobby that we all have, that disease that we, uh, we need some help to pay for, he's an electronic product design engineer. Uh, in Rockford. So help me please if you would welcome Kurt Lewis. Can you hear this okay? Great, what a great place we have here. This is my first visit to the uh, museum here in Oshkosh. And uh, like you said, I'm from Rockford, Illinois, and if that rings a bell with anybody, we had the great idea of telling the uh, annual EAA convention that uh, we didn't want you messing with Rockford anymore. And <laughs> what, a, what a stupid thing to do. You guys would be coming to see me in Rockford if we wouldn't have made that mistake here today. Let me get this going back here again. I've, uh, I've learned a lot of things here since I've been listening to people talk. Uh, my flying was all in a uh, Cessna. I don't have any like lights or type of things or uh, uh, ultralights. I thought I would be talking to people that didn't have a lot of experience with landing out, but the more I uh, the more I talk to listen to conversations here, maybe it's because it's ultralights or something. But you guys have more land out experience than I do, I think, and I'm quite right. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to be teaching how much I'm actually going to be teaching, but I'm going to try to talk about the, the things that we learn and train with in gliders that should help you if you ever are unfortunate enough to uh, get in that circumstance. Uh, about half of what I'm doing is just introducing you to soaring. We have a terrible identity uh, crisis in our sport that whenever you say gliding or sailplane, the first thing they think of is either something like this, a primary trainer glider, or it's a hang glider. And I, and I love hang gliders. Uh, I think they're really cool, but what we do uh, is a long ways away from the hang glider. But the general public seems to think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about gliding. Um, I want to specifically identify skills that glider pilots have that can cross over to the pilots. One of my goals is to, something I say here today, I hope comes to mind every time you fly, every time from here on out, and I hope something I teach today, every instructor in the room will also recall that when they're instructed do the same thing. A quick poll, how many pilots have experienced partial power loss on takeoff? Just something happened on the takeoff. Okay, how about uh, on landing, where you're in the pattern and something comes up, you know, car icing or something like that, good? How about complete power loss on takeoff? Okay, and you just went up quick, man, okay, you got more experience than I can. On landing, you're in the pattern, the engine quits from full or cross okay? How many landed back on the runway after that partial power loss? Okay, how many on a uh, field had to, had to walk in? Wow. You guys should come and speak at my glider operation. And how many chose the road to land successfully? Did that work out okay? Landing on the road? Okay. My glider, my glider has a 50-foot wingspan. 
It's actually pretty good size of road, too, so we try to stay away from the road. How many flight instructors here? How many glider pilots? Oh, very good. Oh, hang glider. I should have been more specific. How many sailplane, sailplane pilots? And how many have flown in the glider? I'm talking about, wow, that's very good. <coughs> okay, now don't answer this. I just wanted, this is another poll. How many people know where the term dead stick landing came from? That's what I thought. I had to look this up the other day because that's what, you know what we refer to when we say a dead stick landing? Dead stick, you've heard that expression when the engine quits and can land? That expression, I just, like I said, I just learned this a couple days ago. That expression came from with the original wood propellers. It was referred to as the stick. So they called it a dead stick when the engine quit. You basically had a dead stick out front. Because I always associated it with the joystick. I'm thinking, why do they call it a dead stick when there's nothing wrong with the joystick? <laughs> so they called the stick the propeller. One good thing about gliders is I've never had to worry about the engine quit. <laughs> That's very important. This is my glider. I was taking it at a, at a race. It's called a Genesis. Um, kind of a medium performance racing glider. When it came out, it was competitive, but things developed very quickly. The Germans are always a couple steps ahead of us in uh, designing the airplanes. But I just want to quickly go through how gliding operations, at least in this part of the country, work. And then I'm going to show a video that, as the video goes on, I can point out some things. Basically, uh, we get towed up behind what amounts to a 200 foot long ski road. Uh, there's a, a special hook at the back of the tow plane, which very commonly in the United States is a Piper Pawnee crop duster. If you're familiar with those, we strip all the agricultural spray equipment off, and the power to weight ratio is, is very, very good for towing gliders. Very lightweight, very easy, fun to fly, very strong, rugged. We can run them all day long on multiple tows, they work out great. So we're behind this 200 foot um, ski rope, and uh, gliders on the ground are not very, uh, shall we say, uh, graceful. Uh, the gliding community generally, well, hence the word community, uh, you can't just hop, unless you have a, a power glider, a motor glider, um, it takes a team of people to get the glider out of the hangar. Uh, usually we use golf carts to get them out the sides of the runway. It takes people to, once you get in, it takes another person to get you out on the runway and rotate the glider. So it's kind of a more community type sport. Uh, it takes a number of people on the ground. Um, and uh, there's some, uh, sometimes if radios aren't required, but we usually have radios where we can talk with the tow pilot. But there's conventional signals we use to uh, communicate visually with the glider and the tow pilot. Um, there's signals that the, the tow plane, usually a Pawnee, will take up the slack and the rope so the rope is tight. Uh, usually a wing runner will pick up the tip because normally we just have a, a, either a single wheel near the center of gravity or maybe tandem wheels that just sits on the nose wheel. And uh, give the signal, the tow plane starts to accelerate. The glider flies at much lower airspeed so it leaves the ground much earlier than the tow plane. So we're basically flying three or four feet off the ground for a good 100 or 200 feet holding that position just above the ground until the tow plane gets up to speed and then starts climbing out. Then we're climbing out at about 400, 500 feet a minute, depending on how heavy the glider is and who we've got as passengers and how hot the day is and all those things performance wise. Um, a thing to stress about uh, glider flying is if you've ever watched it or you watch the videos, it very much gives the illusion that the glider pilot is basically just along for the ride back there, that this tow rope doing all the work. It couldn't be any farther from the truth. If you ever add a glider rating onto your pilot certificate now, you will find that the most difficult thing to learn is the tow process from that takeoff. And you're literally flying formation. If you, if you, uh, now see, I'm, I was thinking of Cessna Skyhawks when I was preparing this talk. I didn't realize how big of a percentage of the population here would be, uh, the attendees would be ultra-wise. But if you can imagine uh, having two Skyhawks out on the runway, and the front one is 200 feet ahead, and we want you to fly up and maneuver around and never get more than 200 feet behind the plane in front of you, and you have to stay behind it. That's what we're doing in a choir, and we're teaching kids 13 and 14 years old, I think it's the youngest ones, and it's, uh, we have simulators.
that unless you're a glider pilot, I would challenge any one of you to be able to fly the simulator. Uh, it's called Condor, if you're going to get into it, we can talk more about that later if you want. But uh, it's quite a different skill. So that, that, takes some, uh, that takes some learning to do. Uh, the tow plane then would generally take us up to two or 3,000 feet above ground. There's control inside the glider that we pull a cable and it releases the jaws that holds the, the rope. The tow plane goes back down to pick up the next glider, but the 200 foot rope trailing behind the, the Pawnee. Uh, then we're up there, um, I'm gonna go through the performance of a few of the gliders that we use, but generally from 150 to 250 feet a minute sink rate. So we can climb up to 3,000 feet. The time it takes to get up there and glide back down might be a 20 minute ride or so, if there's no lift. I'm going to show a few videos now. This uh, first one, I, I've thrown a lot of contests out of Waynesville, Ohio, a club called Caesar Creek Soaring Club, that uh, every year they have a wonderful week-long soaring camp, a youth soaring camp, where uh, kids come in and uh, learn about gliding aviation. It's a great, you know, just a great event for, for young kids to get into. And uh, this is a beautiful airport. Uh, one of the pilots there did a lot of neat drone footage. And uh, they edited this little promo thing for their, their youth event, their week on camp. But it's a great, uh, a really nice introduction to what the is about. I'm going to have you switch over. This, I'm going to show three videos. Three videos. <laughs> Can we get the volume up on that a little bit? Because there's some kids talking on this too. I actually, at the end of that row, they rent you can call it my camera because they rent it to me every year I go back there. That's our Bonnie. I don't know, watching these kids, I get emotional watching this. I don't know if it's the kids or the music that gets to me, but it's, it's really good.
lighters aren't as quiet as you might think. And it's like going down the highway with your windows cracked in your car, especially these trainers. They're, they're not as good. There we go. Yeah. It took me a while to figure out there. You missed the carrier landing, so they squirted in the water like the thing. What can they say? <laughs> Young man's first solo. You guys are familiar with that tradition, right? Get your shirt cut out. I did that when I got my ball. Oh, you dump there. I'm sorry, but you do the you dump water on the guys after they're done. And at Caesar Creek, they have they go one above the water bucket. He's getting a trip to the pond.
lessons in Sylvania, this, this is one of our trainers right here. And I want to go through some of the performance numbers because you're probably all familiar uh, every time you do a landing pattern and you pull back on the throttle, you get a rough idea of what your, your glide angle is going to be. And, and I suppose a lot of planes, you carry some power on downwind. Uh, and a lot of it is just repetition. You get used to what your plane is doing at a given power setting. But in gliders, we measure a lot by sink rate. We measure by how far over the ground. When you see uh, a glide ratio of 22 to 1, that basically means for every unit of measure high, we can go 22 units long. So if you're 1,000 feet high, you can go 22,000, or I'm sorry, 1,000 feet, yeah, 22,000 feet far. If you were a mile high, you can go 22 miles. That's another way to put it. This is one of our trainers. This is my racing plane. My glide ratio is about 42 to 1, which means from 1,000 feet, if you think about that, if I was entering the pattern at 1,000 feet, and I chose not to land, and all I was going to do is hold perfectly steady, I could fly eight miles before I would touch down. That's how the flight of the You recognize this glider? It's been in the news lately. The Perlon Project. They're trying to get over 100,000 feet in that glider. This is pressurized, but notice what they're using for a tow point. <laughs> They've got this state-of-the-art, you know, nothing like a pressurized sailplane, and they're still using that's over 60, 60 to 1, so if you, again, imagine a thousand feet entering downwind, it can fly for 12 miles before it will touch down. And I just found out, again, a couple of days ago, that the two pilots that are flying this were doing a practice run in a different glider. It wasn't this one. They broke the national speed record for 300 kilometers out return, which is 186 miles, at 190 miles an hour. And that is flying way out west where the, if you're familiar with that, the phenomena of, of large jet stream air flying over mountain ranges. If you fly in the right spot of that rising air, you're basically flying at the max speed of the plane can go. And they did it on the third attempt. So they were up there and they actually kept thinking they could do it faster. 190 miles an hour is really This is the lowest performing glider I know of. <laughs> I tell people, lots of times when I'm giving rides, I tell them that the space shuttle, people don't think about it, space shuttles are glider. Uh, in fact, uh, I see uh, in the museum here, uh, what's the spaceship one, is that what it's called, they had the thing? Those guys had to get glider ratings to fly those. If you remember, they had an end number on them, and you have to have a glider rating to fly a glider. So those were, I guess NASA got some wave or something, I don't know if these guys had glider ratings, but uh, it doesn't fly very well. About four to one, so if you're at a thousand feet, you go about three quarters of a mile. Boeing 747 has a 15 to one glider ratio. And you've heard the stories about, you know, if, if they, uh, you know, engine failure at 30,000 feet, they do have some options. They can, uh, uh, they can, they've got time to make some decisions. <clears throat> this is the sad part. I really thought, I don't know how many people fly, like, Skyhawk, Cherokee, stuff like that. Is that, wow. So, so most of the people here are doing, like, ultralights. I don't know why things that Okay, I picked the Skyhawk to do these numbers with, but... Uh, what's that? The Skyhawk, can you glide farther with your prop? I yep, I'm going to talk yeah. about that. You definitely can. But in the, uh, in the manual, they only, oops, they only talk about with the prop windmilling. And uh, there's some physics behind that, but this is the chart. And I, I use this chart to work it backwards. About a 9 to 1 glide, glide ratio with the prop screen. Um, that's about 1.7 miles per thousand feet. And that's if no control input, no rising air, no sinking air. So if you're in a Skyhawk on downwind and you lose power, if you only flew straight ahead, you can only go 1.7 miles. And in glider flying, I'm going to talk more about this, but we are in, uh, we are constantly aware of altitude and range. All of our flying, we, we can't count on an engine. So in our minds, from that first lesson, students are, are learning about keeping aware of your altitude and your, and your relationship to the airport. So I worked this a little bit more, um, 1.7 miles per hour. That's about a 700 feet per minute sink rate. You have about 90 seconds from 1,000 feet. And again, that's with no control input. As soon as you start turning or any ailerons, rudder, right, or anything, the sink rate goes down. So you're not going to have a lot of time. Actually, 90 seconds seems like a long time to me. But that's what the math works out. So. That's with no bugs on the leading edge of the wing, I guess. You can fly How can we fly more safely to reduce the chance of off-field landings? Airport range awareness. 
That's part of what I'm going to talk about. When, when we fly with the instruments that we have in gliders, um, except when I'm racing in competition, I'm lots of times varying my flight path to stay near airports. And if, if the lift conditions weaken, I will actually anchor over towards an airport until I can climb back higher. I'll talk about thermal flying in a minute. But um, it kind of surprises me when I see uh, how many of our you know, just local fun flying, how much we just basically pick a straight line, you know, you want to go to this flying breakfast or something, you just hit on a course. And part of what I want you to think about is maybe uh, a little more awareness of where the airports are and just to make it a little more interesting, just try to spot new airports on the ground and, and use the sectional chart and your GPS database or whatever. And the, 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 the benefit of doing that is a couple things. One, you can find out where these airports are if you ever need them. But the other thing is, is it's safer to be near these airports this is a, a, a GPS trace of a flight I did uh, years ago from Hinkley, Illinois. And I didn't have a lot of time in a, in a glider at the time. And the uh, glide ratio was 32 to 1, which gave me a range of about 6 miles per thousand feet. Much like a 134. Who had the 134 here? That's yours? Very similar. L3, Planning L33 sold this way. So this was my uh, resulting trace. And see all those dots on there? Those are all airports that were in my database. This is the altitude profile. That's uh, 5,000 feet right there. So that line across the middle, the field elevation in the area might have been seven or 800 feet. Um, so I was over 5,000 feet above ground for quite a bit. But what I, what I put this chart on here for, if I know my range at about six miles per thousand feet, I use a safety cushion and say, okay, if I'm going to be aware that I want to be within four miles uh, of an airport so I can reach the airport. A little bit of another safety cushion we use is we put the floor of the airport about a thousand feet up, which would be like a pattern altitude. So I can be four miles away at two thousand feet, and I can lose a thousand feet to get to the airport and still have a thousand feet to fly in. So what I did was I put a four mile radius around each one of those airports. I flew for 122 miles, and I was only out of gliding range. All these airports here, I could have flown this whole flight from 2,000 feet above ground and been within range of, a, of an airport at all time. Now that, from a glider performance standpoint, that's really not that great. The gliders fly a lot better than that. But from an awareness standpoint, the fact that the whole flight, I knew I was in range of an airport, um, that's why gliders, that's how we can safely fly these long distances and not be so concerned about field weight. Um, I'm going to show you a video that I did. This is a home video, but at least it's, it's not my kids this time. So. I did this, uh, I, I was a holdout on these high-tech phones. I didn't, uh, I didn't jump right on, so I, I, I just had a smart thing for a little while, but now that I can take it with me. more good. This was at the end of the day. 187 miles today. 187 miles. And uh, it's been a really good day. That's right for the airport. Out there, I went Where the EAA headquarters should be. And back and had a, a rough time around uh, Dodgeville. It was really weak. Dodgeville, Wisconsin. But it's, uh, it's doing really good right here. Um, I'm now. See the blue tube right here? Three and a half miles straight south of the wall. Yeah. We drink a lot of water. 600 miles over the joints. So I should have any altitude to get back with we'll no stress. I'll show you my GPS. Moving map here. I don't know if I talk over some of that shows up or not. It helps me keep from getting lost. Yeah, I think I can talk over some. Good day. I won't play that again, but um, what I said on there was I was using my instrumentation there, told me I was 19 and a half miles south of Detroit, 600 feet over glide slope. So what that told me is that if I just held a straight line right to Floyd from 19 and a half miles away, my instrumentation told me that I would arrive, uh, I would arrive at 600 feet over pattern altitude. So when we're flying cross country, we are constantly updating our information on how safely we can get. Now we don't, we don't fly right down to zero belt if we can help. It. There's times where you get low where you know that in your mind uh, you can maybe barely make a place. But the main thing is that we. Uh, Got that. So, hey, that kind of information I have there, what if in power flying you had that kind of information in your ultralight or any light sport airplane? 
What if you had information in your cockpit that you always knew if you were in gliding range of an airport? Um, most GPS programs will have a function of what's the nearest airport, or if you've got a moving map, it'll just show you. But um, there's free apps that you can put on your iPad. A lot of talk here today about what an iPad can do. That can, you can actually put in the, the performance of your aircraft. Let's say your glide ratio was 10 to 1. You could put that in there, and it would actually show you the altitude you would arrive at each one of those airports. In fact, you could put it on your cell phone if you wanted to. The thing is, is you don't want to wait until your engine quits to look that stuff up. It's the kind of thing that when you're flying, when you're flying, it's like another one of a, of a information management kind of thing, information resource that you want to be uh, constantly aware of. Those things. Called, one of, that I use is XCSOAR. XCSOAR and iGlide, I think, is another one. And you can search uh, soaring software probably and find it. And it's really good. It competes with my in my racing work. I I pay. Or five hundred dollars for the software I use, and this free stuff is almost as good as a lot of developers. And we don't always make it back. This is my glider parked behind the trailer, and a uh, really neat design. The trailers. My wife and I can take the wing. Each wing weighs about one hundred and thirty-five pounds, and uh, this wing was stressed to nineteen Gs before the test fixture broke. So they put a lot of neat design in the spar designs, um, but yet lightweight enough to do this. So uh, there it is behind my. Many band, and uh, that's what it looks like before it's getting ready to take off. Take the wing. This is just the general how cross country soaring works. Uh, the ground, when the sun comes out, the ground heats up at different rates depending on the topography. Uh, plowed fields heat up more than wet ground. Um, and what we learn is what generates the best heat off the ground that we have the best chance of finding rising air. What clouds do for us. Um, cumulus clouds show us at least that there was evidence that at least sometime there was rising air. It may not necessarily still be rising when we get to a cloud, but these clouds are like markers. And when we're flying cross country, if it's a, if there's a lot of cumulus clouds up there, we can like leapfrog underneath these cumulus clouds. And as long as they're all working, we say working, that they're elliptical, and that's how we can go these distances. Um, we learn to tell when a cloud is what we call dying, or I think they call it. Yeah, decayed cumulus cloud here. When the cloud is dying, it kind of just starts to fizzle out, it starts losing its shape. That's where the, the rising air has stopped. And a little tip, if you want to fly with less turbulence, don't fly under the clouds. If you stay in the blue, where the blue is, you might have sink, but it won't be turbulence like you have with under clouds. And I found, I talk, when I give talks, I can give a whole hour just on, on thermal uh, detection and flying, but golf courses, cemeteries, Mobile home parks will never fail you. If anything's working, one of those three will work. And mobile home parks, I usually start out saying, what's the leading cause of tornadoes? <laughs> mobile home parks cause tornadoes, we all know that. So there's the best chance of finding them. And there's many times I'll be out in the middle of nowhere and find a thermal looking up, and it's better than everything else I've been finding. A, a fair thermal around here is 200 feet a minute. A good one is three or 400 feet a minute. And I've climbed to some over 1,000 feet. So I can actually outcline the tow plane in my glider and arms good lift. But I've looked down and there'll be an old abandoned golf course. And something about the way they do the ground or prepare the ground or something uh, does that. Big parking lots. Big parking lots. Sometimes out the, when there's a lot of fields, a lot of just cornfields or something, and there's just like one barn or, or silos or something, you know, a farmhouse or something right there, we go to that spot. And that's like the hot spot in all that area, and it's like a chimney effect. The hot air will be there, and all the cool air from the surrounding uh, farm site, farm site uh, comes in underneath it. Um, just talk a little bit more about instrumentation. You recognize that this is my cockpit, my glider. Recognize the airspeed indicator, altimeter, um, radio. I have this uh, this stick. You might recognize this. This was designed for like electric trims. Some home builds might have that, you know, aileron trim, pitch trim. I actually have it tied into my flight computer, so this manipulates the buttons on this computer. But the, uh, what it does is it uses GPS information and uh, uh, the database that shows how far away these airports are. It can actually tell me the best speed to fly between them. It's called speed to fly. And again, that's a whole other physics thing that could be a whole other talk. But uh, this is the uh, moving map display that a lot of you are familiar with. <laughs> 
These are my personal records. 356 miles was my longest uh, duration flight in the glider. Six hours and 15 minutes. Um, you can argue that there's not a lot of power plants that can stay up for six hours and 15 minutes without extended fuel tanks. That's the flight of 356 miles. So if you recognize that this is the Illinois border with Wisconsin, and uh, I actually went out to Mineral Point here, back up to, I'm not sure how far up it goes, Beaver Dam, I'm not sure that might be even farther than Beaver Dam. We'll cover quite a bit of ground, and it's very common for us to come back home. A lot of, I think the FAA thinks that whenever a glider takes off, it's not going to make it back. That's why we have to ride away. They don't, they don't think we can stay up anyway, but um, that was a big flight. I'm going to show you, you mentioned uh, the power, the power parachute thing uh, earlier called the gaggle. This is what, uh, in racing, uh, this, is, uh, this is not my video, but you'll see uh, other gliders out here. This is actually a pretty big thermal. We're quite often flying a lot closer than this. But it's like unrehearsed formation flying. Uh, at a contest, we'll have anywhere from 30 to 70 gliders in the air at the same time. And um, we all get to know each other. We know who to stay away from. We know who to watch when we see somebody out five miles and we see somebody climbing. Uh, we actually use other gliders more than just about anything else if you're in the vicinity to see who's climbing better than the other one. And when you're racing, it's who can climb the fastest usually means who's going to go the fastest. There's a lot of skill involved with in that. Um, he's looking over at the side. My guess is there's another glider over here. And you can also see that on occasion, you'll see one glider, you can literally see that it's starting to sink or rise up. When we're watching each other, that's how we're gauging where we're going to turn. So if the guy out in front of us starts sinking, we'll start tightening up the circle because we don't want to fly in the sinking here the team. It might not be sinking, it may just not be rising as fast as we are. So in racing, it's that it's that game that we're playing as to who can who can out climb the other guy. That's that's a big thing. Yes, I'm sorry, an audio variant I'm going to talk about that was showing you a sensation. You guys fly with a uh, uh, vertical speed indicator. We have what's called variometers that are extremely sensitive uh, uh, vertical speed. It's a vertical speed indicator, but much more sensitive. And we have a uh, something called a total energy probe that works with a static system that can actually sense that if your glider is sinking because you're pitching forward, or if it's climbing because you're pulling back, call those stick burns. And what this, this total energy probe does is eliminates that factor so that you can be flying along at 100 knots or slow down to 40 knots and this instrument tells us whether we're actually in sinking air or, or rising air. That's a very important part. So what you're hearing is an audio indication of rising air or sinking air so we don't have to look at the instrument. You can tell when you're flying with other gliders that close you don't want to be spending time looking at your instrument. That allows us to Sorry? Faster and higher pitched. And it's very depressing when you're low up uh, 50 miles from home and it's going <laughs> It sounds like a submarine diving and, and the stress level goes up very, very fast. I think I put Can you just show the slide show up real quick? Just switch it back. I think I was going to show. Yeah, two more videos. Okay. This next one is part of racing. Uh, if we increase the wing loading in the, in the gliders, our achieved speed uh, gets much higher. And you're going to see this is a, uh, a pass I did at Boyd Airport. The, the never speed, seed speed on my glider is 160 miles an hour, and that's how fast I'm going right here. Um, what you're seeing coming out of the back is water ballast. We usually jettison that. My glider can hold over 50 gallons of water which adds about uh, three or 400 pounds of how much I put in there of weight, and that helps me go faster. I got another video that shows these in the contest. So when we're racing, when you have uh, 30 to 70 gliders in the air, part of what I want to talk about with flying power is uh, just the ability to command air airmanship Okay, this is me, and this is at that Cedar Creek Club where the, where the youth camp thing was. Now, if you can imagine 30 gliders coming back at approximately the same time, they usually spread out a little bit. 
Go ahead. Well, these are actually over three days. This is another day, and I think there might be one more. But what we get good at is uh, when you have four or five gliders in the pattern at the same time, you think you guys have a problem when you're sharing the pattern with some power planes? Try having four or five gliders in the pattern at the same time trying to get down on the same level. And we get very, we get very, very good at uh, precise landing points and uh, uh, just working together to find different points on the runway. That was really my main point, and I just wanted to say that. Uh, and I guess I'll get into this. Two more comments. Yeah. And lots of times we'll make these decisions like an over. I was 19 miles from home and knew I had airport. Sometimes we're 30 or 40 miles away in these racing gliders, and we know we've got enough altitude to get home. So we'll start picking. The closer we get, we'll start picking up speed, picking up speed. So we're the last, the last couple of miles. We're dabbing down the red line. To, to get the fastest speed we can get by the end of the race. If we just floated over at 5,000 feet, it would take us 10 more minutes to get there. So this is really a... Uh, you got hit by Charlie Gold. Uh, my son said we got hit by Charlie Gold's water. Okay, we'll go back to the slides for a minute. That's what a grid looks like for a glider competition. You stage them all out on the runway, and uh, you can't see out there, there's about five pony tow planes off to the side. And uh, the goal is to try to get them all launched in about an hour. That's always the goal. And so then again, you've got you know, this many gliders hanging around the airport waiting for the race to start. Once everybody's up, we start the race. You can have a lot of fun without an engine. I, I hope I can at least cross that over. I can have a lot of fun without an engine. Altitude and range awareness are key to safety. Um, on the pre-takeoff checklist, um, Jimmy mentioned cigar tips. Uh, we have a checklist that we go through, but I think one we stress the most is the very last thing on the list is just what we just call emergency. And we address, um, the comparison is, we have to worry about, in a glider, we do have to worry about the Pawnee losing power, but we mostly are concerned about the tow rope break. If you imagine being in a glider, getting off the end of the runway and the tow rope breaks. But from the very first flight lesson, all the way through the, the ratings and the tests and everything, we are always in our mind flying like that rope could break at any minute. So before takeoff, we, uh, we are aware of the wind direction, the wind strength. Um, we've mentally mapped out the fields. Uh, remember in the video, an excellent video that Jimmy showed that the, the pilot decided to turn when there was a field right in front of him. And we're flying gliders, but we are already thinking that that field's there. It's an awareness issue. Um, turn direction for returning to runway. Uh, if you're, you lose power off the end of the runway, we talk about how high you need to be at that minute. But just deciding to turn the wrong direction can make a difference in whether it's successful or not. If you turn downwind, um, you could be blown so far away from the runway you can't get back. So we're always aware of the wind direction and which way we're going to turn. Uh, we're constantly evaluating that on climb out. Uh, the runway is straight ahead. Uh, the gentleman in that video that flew into the tree, um, I thought I heard the engine kind of hiccuping a little bit long before he was off the end of the runway. Um, Part of what we train for in gliders is, and as the climb out progresses, we're constantly thinking, okay, if the rope breaks now, is there enough runway left to get it on the runway? And then when we pass that point, if the rope breaks now, what's the next option I have? Is it the field off to the side? Is there a field over the runway? And that progresses higher and higher, but it's a continuous process that's trained all the time when we fly. It's part of the test. Uh, when you get your license, every flight review I give, I go through that process and I want to know that the pilot is thinking that the whole takeoff. Um, this 200, 200 foot decision point in gliding, the gliders are similar enough in performance that we kind of have a rule of thumb that if you can reach 200 feet without the rope breaking, if the rope breaks after 200 feet, you can fairly safely turn around and come back to the runway. Now that's not at all true with the planes you guys are flying, but with gliders it's very true. And we practice it very early on in training. Um, I'll usually do it while I'm having a conversation because I don't want the person to know it's coming. I'll be talking to them, I'll be telling them that, hey, look over there, you see that? And I'll pull the reach at like 250 feet. And it sounds like that might be something that you shouldn't do. <laughs> Maybe we should talk about it, not do it. But in wire flying, we do it a lot. And we practice it because when that time comes, it happens, there's no hesitation. The person knows that you're above, you already know you're above 200 feet. 
and you know the right thing to do because just before the takeoff will start, you know the wind direction, you know what direction you're going to turn, you know if there's obstacles on one side of the runway, maybe, maybe because there's silos and trees over here, you still might turn down the wind, but at least you've thought about it before the takeoff will start. Train and practice and test. Three simple practical tests, type review, and field check. Even if somebody new comes to the... Yes, Pat? Going back on the break in the road, Actually, the um, environmental plane, where that release and the tow plane released prematurely. Yeah. We've had an issue where a customer actually pulled. Yeah, we've had a rider one time pull the road by accident. So those things are, you know, so there's part and parcel of understanding <coughs> when that emergency happens, you have to make a decision which will be now. Yeah. And so yeah, stuff happens fast. And, and they were surprises to the letter pilot. Because it wasn't a, a rope break, nor was it um, um, a practice rope break. It was an emergency. It was a real deal, that right? Something let go. Right. It would be like somebody, a passenger, shutting off the fuel valve on your plane and not telling you about it. Um, how many have actually practiced a power failure straight ahead and landed on the runway? You actually do have to practice good. Uh, one key thing, we, I hear this a lot, when Paul Field and Clowns say you got to do a 180 back to the runway. Well, it's not really a 180. If you do a 180, you'll be landing on the road that you came in on when you get to the airport. It's more like a 270 with another 90. So if you're going to go up and, and I suggest you do this in your own plane, is sometime, you know, level off at 2,000 feet, pull the power and see how much altitude you lose when you do a, a 270 and a 90. That's really closer to the reference point you want to use for an altitude. If you don't know the answer to that question, how much altitude does it take to do that, how can you make the right decision if it ever happens to you? So when you're climbing out, if you haven't reached whatever that altitude is, you should already have a plan before that in mind when you're taking off. You should already know in the process what's the next best option. Am I low enough to land straight ahead? Do I need to feel off to the side of the runway? Uh, if I do have to make a turn, I actually think in that video that Jimmy played, I wondered if the guy was thinking he could land on the road. And he uh, he realized too late that he wasn't going to be able to turn back to the road. It really wasn't he was turning steep enough, I don't think, to get back to the runway. Um, there's a big difference between demonstrated and practice. Me just talking about it or your instructor talking about it, you really need to practice real scenarios of this happening. On climb out, often we hear about the first thing to do is nose down to get to the proper airspeed. In a rope break, we're not climbing really, really steep. But when the rope breaks, as you slow down, you don't want to stall spin it, or the closer you get to stall speed, actually the sink rate goes up. But when you guys are climbing out, and some of your planes can climb at incredibly steep angle, if you lose power and your pitch attitude is like this, you don't have a lot of time to get the nose down and get to that speed. That's important. Um, always knowing the best option ahead. The law of primacy, instructors use that phrase, the desire to land on a runway is incredibly powerful. Powerfully strong. And that's why so many people have accidents trying to get back to the runway instead of taking the next best option. Um, turn coordination is something that we'll talk a lot about in flight. A mental, visual thing. If you're turning low to the ground, um, the temptation is a, a bit of a fear to maybe at least empower flying in, in the riders initially. Um, it's hard to do a 45 or 60 degree bank 100 feet off the ground unless you're done it. The aircraft doesn't know how far off the ground it is. It will fly the same. Um, what happens lots of times, someone turning low to the ground, they bank less than they should and they use more rudder than they should. And how do you enter a spin? Slow it down near stall speed and kick the rudder over just before stall speed or at stall speed. And a lot of stall spin accidents when people trying to get back to the runway happen because they're they're pulling up because they don't think they don't want to sink, and they're using the rudder to skid around because they're afraid of banking. This is something you can practice. Just practice uh, slow flight, strong 45 degrees one way, 45 degrees the other way. Get used to using the rudder. And gliders with that first shell we have, every time you move the stick, you're moving the rudder. Uh, you guys have a turn and bank indicator. We have, if you notice, I meant to talk about this, we have a little red piece of yarn stuck on the canopy that anybody 
anybody notice that? That was actually a Wright Brothers invention. The early Wright Flyers did not have vertical stabs. Remember those before the, the, they got into the popular gliders? And they realized that the uh, efficiency of the wing was being compromised when they were skidding, so they came up with a vertical stab. Then they said, well, how do we know how much is skidding? And they tied a piece of yarn on one of the uprights. So now on our gliders, every glider, you'll see a piece of yarn taped on the can. You can have a $250,000 sale plan, and it'll have a red piece of yarn, because there is no better instrument for a glider pilot, and it's like a weather band, an extremely precise weather band. Actually had, a, if you remember the Harrison Ford case where he went to the golf cart course in 22, I am sure he knew that golf course was there when he took off, and he probably thought about it every time he took off. I saw a satellite view of that area. That was the only open space in that city area where he landed. And my bet is, is that he knew that he shouldn't turn, try to turn around the back of the runway. He landed in the Aviate Navigate Community. That's a popular course. Captain Sully is a glider pilot. Remember the miracle on the Hudson? If you remember the radio conversations, he said that he needed to divert because they had the geese that flew in the engine, they had power loss. And they gave him the options. And because he was a glider pilot, he was pretty quickly able to assess by his, his aiming point that he was not going to be able to make it to the airport they were offering. And again, you can, you can hear it on the uh, radio call where he says, we're going in the Hudson. Being a glider pilot would probably save those people's lives because I think a lot of a lot of pilots would have tried for that airport and probably killed a lot of people on the ground. Besides all, so he did the right thing. It turns out that Jeff Skiles, the co-pilot, has flown in Sylvania soaring in Boyd. He's uh, he flies a glider out there, uh, not on a regular basis, but he's been out there. Basic right. Um, you can practice all these things. Uh, a big thing with gliders is we always come in high with more energy. What we get good at, we can land, I mean, I can land on the numbers plus or minus 15 feet routinely. It's not hard to do because we get very, very good at glide slope control. Um, I, I don't know if I have time to show a video here, but it's uh, very important that you get good in your aircraft at how quickly and how steeply you can descend. It doesn't do any good to pick out a field and then not be able to uh, get to the field. But if you can pick a good field that's closer and you're good at descending steeply, uh, whether it's slipping. Uh, the bad thing about flaps on a lot of planes, once you put flaps in, you can take them back out. So try to learn to get as good without using flaps. Use flaps after you absolutely know you're over. Trying to restart the, the engine is always second priority to finding the best field and heading towards it. In the video I saw during the break of uh, the ultralight that crashed just like a week ago, um, what I noticed when he first started having engine problems, he passed up two or three good fields on the right. I think if I was having engine problems, I would find the best field I could first and circle around that field. Um, and it's easy to quarter, you know, armchair quarterback or whatever after the fact. But um, if you think about how big the field was mm -hmm. when he hit the trees, I mean, there was like, there was a lot of room. So thinking as far ahead of the plane as you can um, to make the best choice. I'm going to let this go. This is a good video. You can search YouTube for people making uh, dead stick landings in planes. This is a good video. If you want to email me later, I can send this to you. Uh, an instructor actually demonstrates shutting off the engine on a Cessna 172. He does all the right things. He shows about using S-turns to come down so he doesn't dump the flaps or put the flaps in. Um, that's really important. Um, if restart not possible, roads, you really have to know the roads. Power planes with shorter wingspans, we act, except when you know out west where the, the roads without the signs are. In gliders, we avoid roads. There's almost always signs or something, signposts or something on the side of the uh, Range awareness um, comes from practice. If you pull your, even though it, could, it probably won't be stopped, but if you pull back to idle and just start practicing, seeing what the sight line would be. If you're if you're gliding along at, at idle, 
Look out and see what you think you can preach. So that if that ever happens, if you lost power, basically get to treat your plane like it was a choir. And if my engine failed right now, how far could I go? What's the sink rate? How much time do I have? We can rehearse all that. What do you tell your passengers calmly? <laughs> you don't want to, you know, you're going to be panicked enough. You should uh, try to do your passengers the courtesy of going through it. All those things we're supposed to tell our passengers about how you lock your, how you do your seat belt, how you lock the doors. Believe me, and someone's panicking if a plane is on fire and they're trying to get their seat belt off. That could, that could be a challenge for somebody. If it's a seat belt they're not used to, like in a car. Just opening the door, a lot of our planes have pretty strange latching mechanisms. We're taking an extra second, but if you're at 5,000 feet and you know you're going to land in the field, take some time to get people calmed down. Constantly assessing uh, the airports that are within reach, and always, as you're flying, vary your course to stay close to the airports. Always look for fields along the route to give you a In our gliders, we have so much time, I'm, I'm preparing for landouts 10 minutes before I have to, because my glide, my sink rate is so low. You guys don't this was my first land out. That's the airport there. I chose that field. When I got to this point, I could not see the airport, even though my GPS told me I could reach it. I made the decision to turn and go right here. There it is sitting. I was pretty happy. <laughs> this is my second one. The field landed there. And then I realized after I landed, actually, I saw this. I didn't see it from the air. These were power lines going over the road. I saw these. I did not see this. There was power lines twice as high as the ones I had seen. But what was good was I was aiming for the middle of the field. There's also a law of primacy that says we need to land at the beginning of the field just like we land at the beginning of a runway. There's no reason to chance that. If you're trying to save yourself, aim for the middle of the field unless it's really small. Uh, don't, don't even chance trees in a power line. That was a field in... Uh, uh, Harris Hill, New York, I landed and opened the canopy and the girl comes out of her house and says, uh, Mom, there's an airplane in our yard. <laughs> that was my, by my fourth field landing, it gets so comfortable, pretty soon you're thinking, okay, what's the best road to get my trailer from here? <laughs> While you're coming down to land, you're thinking, well, you know, the airport's five miles that way and I'm going to tell my guy, this is while you're preparing to land. It gets more comfortable. This was, at a, this was the Nationals that I won. It's a 1963 Schweitzer 126. Very low performance. Um, they're a challenge to fly because you're always just a few minutes from landing out. So it's very stressful, but we're not. We had three glides with guys. And this one made the center of the magazine. That was a mansion. This, this thing was like the nicest grass runway I'd ever landed. It's just a field with this guy's. Uh, I had some contest landings. An example of a 126 glider. Uh, you can see in some of these videos that people are panicked and they're flying way too fast. You can see it in uh, the adrenaline is high, and the reality of it is it's simple physics. That the slower you can get it down without stalling, the less energy there is. So if you're going to go into a rough field or go into trees or anything else, uh, speed is not your friend. Consider emergencies. Before you take off, before you start to take off, well, think about all the options you have. Uh, practice entering patterns from different altitudes in different areas. I mean, we're so part part of what when we practice like pattern flying, we come in and we're at the perfect altitude on downwind. We're at the perfect space for the runway. Uh, we pull carburetor heat halfway down the runway. We pull back to idle or whatever the RPM at the end of the runway. Uh, we go out just the right distance and we rehearse it to the point where if we can't do it that way, we're not prepared for it. I say practice coming in from do right angle patterns. When, don't do this at a busy airport, of course. Uh, come in into oblique angles. Uh, do everything you can to get out of that box that we always practice in because when it's an emergency, you won't have that. Uh, practice different means of, of uh, people that fly planes without flaps have a big benefit here. If you get really good at slipping and doing S turns, Here's the best training. Get a glider rating. If you've got a power license, it's extremely easy. Ten solo flights. There's no um, written test. There's just a flight test. If you're an active power pilot, it'll take about 15 dual flights before you solo. You can have a blast doing so. Even if you never get your rating, I'm telling you, solo a glider and learn about thermally enabled flights, it's a blast. 
And then there's like three review flights to take the, uh, the flight test to get your rating. And it's self-certified medical. There's no medical requirement. <laughs> so I hope I've given you something to think about every time you fly. I hope I've given instructors something to talk about every time they teach. And this may fail you, but gravity never will. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Interesting presentation, huh? Yeah. Um, I'm running to, uh, to head to Beloit and uh, get that uh, 10 hours of uh, dual and Rose, that's J3's checkout you were getting, it's gone. I'm going to spend it with her. <laughs> However, I will say, if I'm ever flying with him and he says, hey, look at that, I'm going to cover up the uh, tow rope release so he can't grab it. <laughs> I, 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 I picked up that one thing. Hey, so talking about picking things up, before I bring up uh, Steve to uh, wrap up, those of you that wanted a, a attendance or participation certificate, we've got those. They're on the back table. If you haven't picked them up, please do so. And